In 2009, you outlined five goals for the Department of the Navy uh, to achieve greater energy security. What is, I'm sorry, why is energy security so important to the Navy and Marine Corps? Well, energy security is national security. It, it, we would never let some of the countries that we buy fossil fuels from build our ships or our aircraft or our ground vehicles, but we give them a vote. We give them a vote on whether our ships sail, our aircraft fly, or our ground vehicles operate. And even if we could produce all the oil and gas we needed in the U.S., fossil fuels are still the ultimate global commodity. And so every time the price of oil goes up a dollar a barrel, for example, it costs the Navy and Marine Corps $30 million. So for FY11 and 12, that was a billion dollars in unbudgeted fuel bills. There's not many places to go get that money. Uh, there's operations, so we fly less, we steam less, we train less. Or if the bill gets too big, we start cutting those platforms that we've talked about. And neither one of those is an acceptable answer. So the, the push for different energy, push for different kinds of energy, how we get it, how we use it, is for one reason, and that's to make us better war fighters. It's, it's got some side effects of uh, lower carbon, of being better stewards of the environment, but those are definitely side effects. It's to make us better war fighters. That's the only reason that we're doing it. That's the only reason for the Navy and for the Marine Corps. The cost of not doing it, for example, for the Marines, uh, at the height of the fighting in Afghanistan, for every 50 convoys of fuel that were being brought in, we lost a Marine, killed or wounded. That's too high a price to pay. That's why we're doing it. Thank you. What are some of the key energy initiatives from the Navy and Marine Corps that are helping the department achieve your energy goals? Well, there are a lot. One is where <clears throat> we demonstrated the Great Green Fleet last year at RIMPAC, uh, a carrier strike group that every single type of aircraft flying off the carrier flew on a 50-50 blend of biofuel and aviation gas and every single surface ship ran on a 50-50 blend of <clears throat> marine diesel and biofuel. And the big news out of that was there were no news. Uh, we've, under presidential directive, the Department of Energy, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Navy has been engaged in um, efforts to set up a nationwide biofuel industry and we have four companies now contractually committed to producing up to 170 million gallons of biofuels a year by 2016-2017 at uh, a good bit less than four dollars a gallon. So very, very competitive prices on this. We're doing things onshore. We're doing things w with solar and wind. We're doing things with geothermal and hydrothermal and wave. We are a long way down the road and we're going to meet the goal that we have that by 2020 at least half of all naval energy floating ashore will come from non-fossil fuel sources. Okay. You just mentioned this but one of your energy goals for the Department of the Navy is to sail the Great Green Fleet by 2016. Uh, what sort of progress has been made toward achieving this goal since demonstrating a green strike group in local operations in 2012? Well that was the first first step, we said that we would demonstrate it in 2012. When I announced that in 2009, a lot of doubters as to whether we could do that. Uh, but we did it, we did it on schedule, we did it as part of the Rim of the Pacific exercise. Now the just normal deployment of a carrier strike group using the 50-50 blends of biofuel and aviation gas or the nuclear and the carrier and the um, the 50-50 blend for the surface ships. Proceeding, we're, we're working with allies, working with allies around the world in terms of being able to procure and get biofuels where, wherever we go. Um, the Australians are a good example. Last year at RIMPAC, uh, a senior Australian naval officer flew over from an Australian ship on a helicopter we signed a memorandum of understanding about what we were going to do, how we were going to uh, share information on biofuels and our research and our activities on that. And uh, 
his, his helicopter was refueled on that 50-50 blend. When the press asked him, they said, how committed to this program are you? He said, I'm getting on that helicopter. That's pretty committed. If we could revisit power for a minute, okay. um, also one of your top priorities. How is this relevant to the everyday lives of sailors and Marines, and how does it impact their day-to-day -day routine? Well, <clears throat> in a lot of ways. One is just the culture is changing in the Navy. Uh, I visited Macon Island, which is a hybrid ship. It's got an electric drive for speeds under 12 knots, normal drive for speeds over 12 knots. And they saved almost half of their budget. Uh, they went out with a uh, $34 million fuel budget on their last deployment, came back um, having, having spent about $18 million of that. But when I visited them, they were very proud of that, but the thing that, one, that the engineering officer said that he was the proudest of was how young sailors, you know, third class petty officers would come up and say, I've got an idea of how we can save some more fuel. I've got an idea of how we can save some power here. I've got this idea and how that it's become ingrained that you're looking for ways to do that. And it's as simple as changing the light bulbs. Instead of using the regular kind of bulbs, we use put, uh, put these LED bulbs in. That can save one or two percent on the total fuel bill. So that sort of thing. But I'll go back to what I've said over and over again. It's going to impact sailors because it's going to make us better at our jobs. It's going to make us less dependent on uh, foreign sources of fuel. And it's going to take us out of the big price spikes. The price spikes, the shocks that to the system. And so we won't be making the trades between readiness and buying fuel. We won't be making a trade between buying enough fuel to get the platform there and building the platform in the first place. So it will have an impact, whether seen or unseen. And I think a lot of them will be seen because of some of the efficiencies that sailors are going to see at sea and on their ships, on the bases at home. But it's also going to have an unseen impact that we'll have more money to do the things that the country expects us to do, things like training to be ready to, to, um, to go on deployment, to be ready to do the incredible range of missions we ask from our sailors every single day.